Hey guys, JB here, the Wolf of Wall Street in the Wolf's Den for another awesome episode of the Wolf's Den podcast. I have a great guest today, another friend of mine, very, very successful young guy. Some of you are going to know him. He's more of a behind the scenes guy, but he's an extraordinary businessman. He's had multiple cash outs. His last one was for close to $400 million to Viacom for a company he founded called Pluto TV. This is actually a streaming service, but it's really functions the way old fashioned TV is, where you just go on and things are already playing, but it's on platforms as a really brilliant idea. And I think what you get to see with Ilya is that he does things in a way that allows him to take the same methodology to any business, any industry, and scaling it. There's one word that would really describe Ilya, to me at least, would be scaling. He's an expert at scaling businesses. And that's an important thing, because I always say, remember, when it comes to making money, building a business, there's two sides to this equation. One side is you have to know how to fail elegantly. How do you go into business and be wrong and essentially minimize on the financial loss, on the amount of time you lose, yet maximize on the lessons learned because the lessons are in the failures. Any rich person will tell you that. And then on the flip side, what do you do when you test an idea and it works? The shit is right. How do you take that small idea and make it a big idea? How do you take a small company and turn it into a large company, a multinational company that sells all over the world? How do you scale? Well, that is where Ilya really stands out and I really hold his feet to the fire and actually make him go through certain steps of what he does, what he looks for in a business and how he knows that moment arrives when it's time to scale and what are the secrets to scaling. All right. Remember guys, you know, we're exiting out of this weird funk of 2020 where we allowed a virus to control our thoughts, our minds, our actions. I never did. Just so you know, you always know I stood strong against it. I was always saying the lockdowns were ridiculous. Now the World Health Organization, wow, lo and behold, they come out and say JB was right. We should have just locked down the people that were most susceptible, older people, people that were immune compromised with comorbidities, right? I was saying that from the beginning. Well, now they're all saying it. So the lockdowns are ending very quickly now. World is getting back to normal. I predict as I always have that somehow, magically, on November 4th, whoa, they stopped talking about the coronavirus. It's back to work. It's the actions you take now. It's the things you do today, tomorrow, the next day. It's going to set you up for this massive ratchet up that we're all about to experience as the economy comes roaring back in 2021. So listen closely to what Ilya has to say. There's so much wisdom in this podcast. And I, I really believe that if you just listen to it and write a few key things down, it will help you scale and take your business to the next level. Let's get to it right now. Ilya Posen, first a couple of quick words from our sponsor, and we're off to the races. All right, listen, you don't need to tell me that running a business is hard work. But if you're still using QuickBooks and spreadsheets, chances are that you're making it far more difficult than it needs to be. That's why it is time to upgrade now to NetSuite by Oracle. Stop paying for multiple systems. Don't give you the information you need when you need it. And ditch all those spreadsheets and old outdated software programs that you've outgrown and just upgrade now. NetSuite is the world's number one cloud business system. Bottom line, it gives you visibility and control over your financials, HR, inventory, e-commerce, and more. It's everything you need all in one place. Best of all, NetSuite is for everyone. Whether your business is doing a million dollars or a hundred million dollars a year, you're going to save a ton of money and a ton of time as well with NetSuite. In fact, over 21,000 companies are using NetSuite right now, so you'll be in great company right alongside them. So let NetSuite show you how they'll benefit your business with a free product tour at netsuite.com slash wolf. That's netsuite.com slash wolf. Schedule your free product tour right now. It's netsuite.com slash wolf. That's netsuite.com slash wolf. All right, so Ilya, here you are. Ilya Posen, the man, the myth, the legend. I have a whole bunch of questions I want to ask you because you're an expert at what I call 
real world the entrepreneurship on steroids. You've had a really big cash out. You sold your last company, Pluto TV, which you were the founder of, correct? That's right. Cashed out for three hundred and fifty million. Yeah, three hundred forty million. Three hundred forty million to Viacom, yep. right? All right. So you're both a, you're actual a real starter of companies. You actually founded it and you got an exit in that really that almost that just not quite a billion but in that really respectable range here yeah um how many businesses have you started before pluto is this your first success or you always been the, someone that started businesses yeah this is my third exit i mean i've tried a few other ideas and businesses that i've tried to start and a few failed but this is this this is obviously the big one but uh this is my third exit the first one i did was uh, a digital agency so i ran a, a company that essentially built apps websites and did online marketing i did that for about 10 12 years and uh, that's where I really got all my knowledge of how to build companies and startups because we got to use other people's money and we took that money and we grew their businesses or we grew their startups from nothing, right? right. And that experience, literally, whether it was like a dentist website or a dating app or you know a movie theater, whatever it was, right? We, it Get gave us- the driving traffic, basically. Yeah, well, we built their product, right? And then we had to market their product. And, and we learn how to market a pro if you can't, you can't really market a product that doesn't work, right? So first you have to build a successful product. And usually clients give you very limited amount of money to do it with, right? It's not like an unlimited amount of cash. Give me an example. So I don't know, somebody would come to us and say, I have $50,000 and I want to build a dating app, right? And you know, you look at something like a Tinder, they probably took millions of dollars to get to where they were, right? So, but we have to figure out how to do it for 50. And, and when you get, we're, you're given that kind of budget, right? You have to figure out what is the minimum amount of work I need to do in order to prove out the business every step of the way. So you build a little bit, you put it out there, you validate it, right? If it works, you continue. If it doesn't, you kind of change a little bit and you go a different direction. So, and you do that with such efficiency after doing it so often and often and often that you have just, I just started to get this insane pattern recognition, right? And, you know, start, like building startups is not that different from being a scientist. You have to come up with an idea, right? And then you have to prove that idea out. And you come up with various hypotheses and you, pr you prove them out along the way by conducting experiments, right? right? Experiments and, are your trials, right? Yeah, your yeah, trials. Yeah. But a lot of people make the mistake of like, all right, I know exactly what I want to build, right? And then I'm just going to go get a bunch of money and I'm going to build it. It's going to take me six months, a year, two years, right? And then I'm going to put it out. I'm gonna see if it works. And I can tell you from experience, 98% of the time, it will fucking fail, it won't work, right? So the right way to do it is to prove out a little bit at a time, put it out there and see if it works. So you build a little bit, put it out there, drive users to it, see how they react. And if it works the right way, and the numbers are right, then continue. So I have a, a theory of entrepreneurship. I say, there's two things you have to know how to do. You have to know how to, number one, fail elegantly as an entrepreneur. Right. Yep. How do you go into business and be wrong and essentially maximize on the lessons learned? Because the lessons are all in the failures, right? You yep. learn massively from that. So I say failing elegantly is about failing cheaply, mean not betting the pharma ideas, right? And also failing quickly. Like as you're saying here, like some people will they'll they'll spend so much time trying to build the perfect mousetrap when you know, you really need to see very quickly whether or not the idea even had traction before all the beautiful bells and whistles come out of it, right? Yeah, that's so right. failing quickly is part of failing elegantly, and succeeding wildly is what do you do when the shit is right? What do you do when you test an idea and like, oh my God, suddenly you got that one that has traction. How do you take that and really scale it, right? Yeah, yeah. yeah. I mean, I think that's 100% right. And, and the power of tech, and I've been in tech, you know, my whole life, the power of it is it allows you to test things out very quickly and efficiently and early on. Like these days, Let's say you have an idea, right? And before even building it out, you can kind of get a sense whether it will work or not before even building one single thing, before building an app, before building a website. You can literally go on Facebook, for example, like give me an, give me an idea, come up with something right now. Jordan Belfort dating app. Perfect, all right, we'll Jordan Belfort dating, dating right. app probably we'll, we'll won't dating, work, right. but maybe will. So look, so you create uh, an ad, right, on Facebook with your value proposition. You create a basic landing page for like 30, 40 bucks. And you take that ad and you put it out to a bunch of users and you see what's the click-through rate, right? Is it gonna cost me 10 cents to get somebody to click to my landing page or is it gonna cost me $3? The difference between that cost already dictates whether this is something that people generally want or don't want, right? And so you can almost fake it as if this is a real business. You can create an ad, you could put it out there. And based on the early indications from that data, you can make a decision whether you want to continue or not, right? I, back in the day, I had this idea for, uh, that I, I wanted to build for, you know, like a gifting product that I wanted to put out there. When somebody's sick, right? When somebody has the flu or something, I thought, you know, a, 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 like a care package, but same day delivery would be a great idea. So before building it out, you know, and things like that, I literally just went, put an ad on Facebook 
And what I realized is there's actually, it's very difficult to market to someone to figure out when they're sick, right? So you don't, so there's no like, like when, you, when you're picking your target audience, you can't like find people who are sick, right? You right. Can't, I try to look for signals on Twitter when people are saying, oh, I don't feel well. It wasn't a good market. So I, I, I completely nixed the idea because there was no proper marketing channel, right? Sure. Could the idea still work? Maybe. But if there's no proper marketing vehicle to actually drive users and acquire them on a, on a favorable, unfavorable terms, I, I just stopped the idea. You know, so do you consider that a failure? Um, I don't know. But so like, why would you intuitively you said Jordan Belfort dating app? And I just made that up off the top of my head because you just said dating app before. But yeah. why did you say that with Mark? What, what, what about no, that just, idea? No, seriously, no. Why wouldn't that mean? Do you have a certain sense of what makes an, an idea a good idea or a bad idea? Or intuitively? Because intuitively, I, I've been approached many times. I just never did it because I, I didn't think it was kind of on brand for me. And like, I, you know, because I was approached with like a hookup site, you know, yeah. you know, hottest chicks, you know, wolf or what, blah, blah. And, but why was it that you said that instantly it probably wouldn't work? What, about, is there something about ideas, not just that one, that sort of just say, eh, you know, yeah. What, yeah. What, what is it? I mean, I think by, so when I ran this agency, right, we built 300 projects per year and I did it for over 10 years. So that's 3000 different projects. When you do that many projects in every single category from startups to existing businesses, from online marketing to development for literally the whole, the whole gamut, I just started to get insane pattern recognition and, and, and to a point where somebody would throw something out, I would have a pretty good guess at whether it would work or not, right? And this could be even, it, it could be as something as big of, as a full idea, right? But it also could be as, as much of a feature. Like if we already have this business, should we add this on or should we not? Mm -hmm. um, and of course, you still have to validate and, and prove it out because I could be wrong, but, but the experience gave me so much pattern recognition. I think your dating app, just my instinct, I think it's, you know, in order to have a successful dating app, you have to properly attract both genders, you know, unless it's like a hookup site or something. And I just think uh, from your brand, a Jordan Belfort dating app may not work well for, you know, both sides. Why? I, I, I just, that's just my gut instinct. I don't know. It wouldn't attract males or females. I think females would think it's more of a hookup app. Well, let's call uh, it a hookup uh, app then. Well, then that might work, <laughs> but you might have like 90% guys. In there. I get it. Yeah. yeah. So, so what about, so what about things like, for example, that, uh, in the last five years, are there any great success stories that you looked at and said, Psh, that'll never work. And then it became successful. Not really. No. I mean, I, I, I can't remember one thing that I thought was going to completely tank and then, and then it became huge. I mean, I just, it doesn't mean like I, I thought the other way around. I try to like, I, like not make grand opinions about other people's shit like that on that kind of level, you know? Has there been anything that you have looked and say, wow, oh my God, I wish I would have thought of that idea in the last five years? Um, of course. I mean, in retrospect, I think there are a lot of things that like you wish you built. Um, for but, example, I mean, like from the from the social media perspective, obviously, like, like the TikTok and stuff of the world, you, but you can never predict those kind of trends. I think those things are very, um, you can't, you can't predict that all of a sudden, like vertical videos swiping up and down is going to be the thing that makes the, like the next trend of viral videos or whatever, what have you. But, you know, I, I definitely wish I was part of it. Yeah, it's interesting because so the history of TikTok, it starts off with Vine, right? Yep. And Vine was six second videos. But TikTok is not six seconds. Tick, TikTok has no limit, right? You can make them as long as you want. Correct? I think there's still a limit, but, but they're, they're, they're much longer, yeah, yeah, right? Yeah. What do you think the uh, success of TikTok is about? I think I think uh, just younger kids uh, have a shorter attention span, and and everything these days is very kind of snackable and and shareable, right? So when you have things that are snackable and shareable, you get to give something five, ten, fifteen seconds, and if you love it, you want to tell all your friends about it because you get this feedback loop, and and people are like, oh my god, thank you so much for sending me this hilarious video. This is really cool, and I think. People live off that, right? It's kind of like, it's a way to build habit-forming products. So when you're out there doing your things, let's go back to Pluto now. So why don't yeah. you, let's, for everyone that doesn't know what Pluto is, why don't you explain what Pluto actually yeah. is? So Pluto TV is the, it's the number one free streaming service in the US and now we're, we're actually global. But it's, think of it like, you know, if you have like a Roku or Amazon Fire TV or literally any device, um, we are uh, television. So it looks like a TV guide. There's channels that, that we made up. It's got content for movies and TV shows, you know, what have you. Uh, and it's completely free. So it's ad supported, uh, almost like old school television used to be right before, before cable where, uh, channels were free and there you were paid with ads. And then basically what happened is people start their the cable subscriptions came out and people started paying over a hundred dollars a month for cable subscriptions. And, and they start to have a lot of channels and a lot of channels that people didn't watch. Right. So this, it, what you're seeing now in the market is 
like a huge amount of cord cutting, right? People canceling their, their cable. Um, and when they cancel their cable, they look for alternatives, right? Some of those alternatives are paid services like Netflix. Um, and other alternatives are, are, is a free service of Pluto TV. And, and we know we were first and the fastest to the market and we still have, have our lead. And now, um, thanks to, you know, the, Vi the Viacom that acquired the company last year, uh, we've got even more amazing content and more, you know, kind of steam behind the company. Do you, um, believe in the, the current adage I hear is content is king. Is that true? Yeah. I mean, to, it, it depends on what kind of level, right? So, so if you're um, like a Netflix or an HBO, you, you need winning shows that, um, that allow you to really create a brand and market. Um, what's actually interesting, if you look at the numbers behind Netflix, it's, you, you, you think it's like the orange is the new black house of cards. That's what people are watching. But in fact, people, what people are really watching are the syndicated shows like The Office and Friends, right? And those, but those are not the ones they market with. Mm. So when it comes to marketing, the, the things you market with are not necessarily the things that people consume. And we absolutely we found same that, thing in, in the shoe business, one of Steve Madden's shoes, you know, the things that you advertise, the funky shoe with the seven inch heel and the inverted, like, you know, strap, right? But people buy black basic patent leather mules is like the ones everyone buys. So you yeah. define your brand in one way and make your money typically with more commoditized products, right? Yeah, 100%. You figure out the best way to acquire your users and to retain those users. Um, because if you market with something like The Office and Friends, people are going to look at it as like a low value, right? Oh, I've already seen that. It's around. It's probably on cable, right? But, but you market with something original that people talk about, then you're part of that conversation. Mm. And it's a better hook. People, uh, you get converted to the platform, but then eventually all the viewing hours go into like more syndicated shows that are, you know, that have been there for many, many seasons. What do you think about the business opportunity space on Facebook that's so, you know, so robust with everybody, the next year, everyone's, I'll teach you to be a digital marketer for $2,000 and all these people that are out there selling courses, these how-to courses on some business opportunity. What do you think of that whole market as a, is it, let me just say this. Do you think it's a viable in the sense that people are really getting value there? Is it really more about people that are not experts branding themselves as experts using tactics on Facebook and then just separating people from their money? I think I think it's the latter. I mean, I think in most cases, the people that are kind of self-promoters and, and, and marketing info products, if you will, uh, and claiming to have built multi-million dollar businesses are really running the multi-million dollar businesses selling information <laughs> to people that... and And they themselves haven't actually built a real right. business yeah uh, and and you know but there's nothing like are they maybe they've gathered information from other successful business people and packaged it well together and they're teaching the right things so that's completely possible right but i think they uh, where it's a little disingenuous is i think a lot of times they build credibility off of kind of faking it and they don't really have the right credibility so meaning the ferrari and lamborghini they stand in front of and stacks of money flying around like that that sort of thing i mean i think it's it's just it's part of making great ads and converting people. And, you know, I think a lot of it is show. I mean, there could be real. I, I don't know enough about it, but. Do you think that, like, I guess what I'm really driving at here is that you're a real entrepreneur. You're a builder of businesses, as am I. I mean, yeah. I built businesses my yeah, whole life, right? I sell info products. I'm one of the few people that actually has done what I um, sell. Like, yeah. you know, I've used it to build businesses. That's rare. It's very rare. It's very rare, yeah. right? Um, do you think there's some, do you think Facebook has any responsibility in this, in this level, like that they, they're the platform, right? Like, where do you draw the line? Like, so it's like right now, there's this whole conversation about politics, like, you know, what's hate speech, what's not. Right. What about all the things that are being advertised, all the hokey things that are being advertised on Facebook? Do you think Facebook, or that's simply not their call? They just are out there to make money. They should not care what's being sold or not. Well, they definitely have policies against certain types of advertising. And I think if enough ads get flagged, they definitely look at them and, and remove them. So I think if there's, there's a big campaign and people are getting scammed, um, those ads will should be removed, you know, and I think that's within their policy is to remove. So them. they're doing a good job of that right now. I, think. I, I don't know enough about it, but I think so. I think if it get, if the ad gets big enough and they're scamming enough people, there are going to be enough complaints, right? Um, but I think a lot of times these marketers are also kind of slick and they try to figure out how to how to run things off multiple accounts so they don't create enough of a footprint. You know, um, I honestly like I, I I I'm I think what you did is great when you r ran a successful business. Now you're you're selling how to do it because, right. and you actually have the credibility. You know, personally, I never went down that path. Um, you know, it, and I, I don't know if I still would, I don't know even if today I'll go down, but I prefer to build actual tangible business. And I still do that. You know yeah. me, I, no, still, no, I, do. I, yeah. I actually do. So I enjoy both. I guess for me, it was just an, 
accident. Now, teaching the straight line system yeah. was something I almost had to do because people it really works for people, and I helped so many people with it that it was just like if I almost like I had like almost an, I felt like an obligation to do yeah. it. Really, and I made good money with it, um, but. I love the feedback I get from people who go through the course and they make more money, so it's awesome. What do you think about um, the future of like this whole, like we're in this, this really weird spot right now where if you look at the world as it is today and you go back just like three years ago, it's a different world, like the yeah. world's upside down. Where do you think the world is gonna be in three years from now? In, in, in like a politics or what perspective? Business sense. Like what businesses are yeah. the ones that maybe you should consider going into? What should you stay away from? Um, and is it, is it too late in the sense that, you know, is the, is the tech runaway train, is it just too far ahead or is it never no too late? No, I think it's actually the best time to do it. It's easier today and cheaper today to build, uh, to start and build a business than it ever was. I think, um, you know, you and I were talking about this the other day. There, there's so many, uh, in order to, like, let, let's say you look, let, let's go to that, back to that dating example, right? Mm. Um, if, if you actually wanted to build a, a, a Jordan oh, Belfort dating yeah. app and you, wanted to say, you said you wanted to look just like Tinder or similar to it, it wouldn't cost much. You know, How with, much? Me, under 100000 you wow, know? That it's something that costs, yeah, exactly. And because, how much would that have costed three years ago? It, without, without a real example? Probably closer to the to the million plus that that tender actually cost okay. right? And the difference is is, is a, there's a, there are a couple things, right? So one is you have clear examples, right? So you know exactly like it's the the path has already been paved. The 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 trick the tricky thing about technology is unlike building a, like a house or something, there are no standards and rules and permits, and they're not they're not things that say a door has to be this size. They're not they're not things that says a login button has to comply with these compliant. You know what I'm saying? And so the, the slate is wide open, which means you can literally things can get out of hand, and you can build forever, and you don't know what you're building. But if you have a clear path and you have clear examples and you want to mimic something but make it your own, it's way, way cheaper. So that's like one general idea, right? There's so many things already out there now that the likelihood that you're putting something out there that's completely brand new and, and hasn't existed in some kind of form is very low. So basically, look at what's out there. And, and you know, the, the, I forgot the name of the person, but he said, um, this person said, and, I, and I've stuck to this, to this quote for a long time, you know, don't reinvent the wheel obviously, especially in tech. Don't try to innovate something completely from scratch. Take something that already works and change 20% of it, but 80% of it should be the same, right? Because then you know users are gonna behave a certain way and, and that business work from whatever, what, you know, whatever, whatever the secret sauce is, just 80% of the same and, and, and that works. So, so I think, so first of all, you have a lot of examples, right? So you can look at what's been done and that makes things much cheaper. And then you can point your developers and your marketers to say, hey, this is, this is a clear path of how to do it. Second, there are so the languages and the code and all those things that have, they've evolved to such a degree where if you want to build some kind of feature, it, the likelihood that 80% of the code is already out there that you can just reuse, right? So. So there are already pre-built modules that are wide open, open source to everyone to like grab and modify to be yours that are completely legal and, and yours to do whatever you want with that you can almost like Legos, right? Plug and play a bunch of things together. And then you've got the majority of your, of your app already done. Give me an example of a company in the last few years that did what you're saying. Um, I don't know. Do you remember like the whole Meerkat Periscope thing? Like there was like a, there was this trend it was probably like maybe like five years ago where where it was like let's go live on on Twitter with video, right? And I think the first one was like Meerkat and launched in South by Southwest. And like three months later, Periscope came out, and that's a, that's, a, that's a perfect example because Meerkat used to be the talk of the town. Everybody was saying how amazing it was. This is the new thing. It was it was the new hotness, right? And um, and literally, like, it got replicated within 90 days. And when you can build, when you can replicate within 90 days, it doesn't mean you're putting a hundred engineers and spending a million dollars. You don't need to do that, right? So, is you know, one of the things uh, Warren Buffett is a big believer in. I want to build or go into businesses by them where they have moats around them. Do you believe in that? That you want to have a moat around the business, something that separates you from the competition, I mean, makes it difficult to, to it, duplicate. Yeah, I mean, I think businesses with 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 moats are in tech, it's a lot more difficult, right? I think right now it's, it's more about first mover advantage and 
going as fast as you can and making sure that your competition stays behind you uh, is 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 a much better approach. It's just the way you need to look at it. Of course, if you had some kind of moat, it would be stronger, but it's hard to do it. Like patents don't really go that far, right? You can't really file for trademark patent protection. Like, oh, this is my idea and no one else can copy it because you'll just be stuck in legal while you're getting lapped, right? Right. And so in technology, it's almost like a commodity these days. People can just build whatever you have. I think if you have a brand, like you have a brand, right? right. If you have a brand, that's an incredible moat. Um, and, and if you look at fashion, for example, businesses like that, they have giant, giant brands with huge moats and it's very hard to compete with them because they're established. But those businesses are also very hard to create a startups, right? It's very hard to create a well-known, respected brand that's trusted within you know, a couple years. Yes, yeah. So I had to earn mine. <laughs> the yeah. hard way. It's the a hard way for sure. No, no harder way. <laughs> it's a lifetime. Kids, don't do that. Don't, don't, don't. <laughs> Trust me. People say there's a better way to go out becoming a hassle than the way I did it. Yeah. You know, and it's, it's a one in a billion shot, by the way. That's right. What do you think is the best way, though? Like, so, so for the uh, someone right now, let's say you were, uh, you know, 21, 22 years old, right, and heading out into the business world. Right now, what would you do? What would, what would you? What would be your first move? Um, I. I don't know. If, I guess if you're good at ideas, right, then um, I would take a handful of them, maybe two, three, four, and and I would create, uh, I would try to build businesses out of all of them. Like right now, even though after my successful exit, I'm, I'm building a handful of businesses, but I'm not going out there saying I'm running this company because they're not ready yet. I don't know if they're going to work, right? right. So, so basically take a few ideas and build them a little. Put them out there and see what the feedback is and the ones the, you know the ones that have good reactions and and feel like there could be something there continue on them the ones that don't get rid of them right you know? and so that's what i would suggest is like take but don't but do it the right way don't go out you don't need to go spend thirty forty thousand dollars per app building four different apps or whatever it is you, know, you can prove it out for a couple grand each maybe even less you know and if and if there's legs and there's traction then take the one that that's best and go to the next step and go to the next step but then just just the one thing you should not do is just don't go out there and build for six months, a year, two years, and then put it out there and hope it works. That's just the worst thing you can do in a startup. Do you think that um, the current environment post COVID, like we're in COVID, post COVID, like it's you're in the middle of it, but it's really post COVID. Things have changed. Now. Do you think this is an? It's going to stay this way in terms of like? Do you think that let's just. Flash forward one year from now, right? And there's a vaccine that some people are going to take and some people aren't going to yeah. take, right? But the the pandemic is over and it's business as usual. Do you think business as usual looks the way it used to look or do you think it's no. going to fundamentally change? I think some things will stay the same, but a lot of things will change. Like right? I think there's just behavioral differences. Like, for example... Um, there's delivery, right? Let's look at that as a category. Uh, you know, my parents have never ordered Postmates prior to COVID. They've never or used Instacart to get groceries delivered, right? Now they, they have to. So they, they started using that. A lot of people, I think, started using services that they just didn't use before. I think when COVID's done, they're going to find that, wow, like even though I can go to the grocery store, I can go get my food and pick it up, the other way was actually a lot better and it's a lot more convenient. So maybe I'll stick to those things, right? So I think there are going to be a lot of behavioral changes that people discovered that they weren't actually used to that they're actually going to stick to, right? Um, and I, I, have, I have friends that run funds and you know some of their companies are doing kind of poorly during this whole COVID thing because right. you know, their business, yeah, tough. Are, business but, is tough. But, no a lot, but a lot of these funds have actually allocated additional capital to businesses that are actually doing better during these times, right? Things that are like, uh, for example, like automating uh, factories, right? Things that like require less people, things that mm -hmm. are, are more uh, like delivery type services. Like there, there are a lot of businesses that are actually growing because of COVID, right? Do you think that the upcoming election really has consequences either way? No. It doesn't matter. I, I just, I try not to get caught up in the politics. I mean, obviously it's, it's, it's the talk of everything, right? Um, I think there are views people have and definitely opposing views and different candidates. But I think at the end of the day, we, we've got a system in the U.S. that creates a good balance. Um, and and I, I guess I... I I'm hopeful and I'm trusting that system that it just works itself out, you know, and that crazy shit doesn't get passed to like really screw anything over in a dramatic way. Mm. Yeah, I mean, I think, listen, as much as, you know, everyone knows I lean to the right versus, you know, at least fiscally, I'm socially liberal, but fiscally conservative, right? <laughs> Needless to say. Um, but I, I, I do think there's a certain 
part of the political process that's so disingenuous, like in the sense that like when Biden was campaigning, he had to say things when he was campaigning to be the Democratic candidate, like an act as if he's very, very liberal and and he's probably not that liberal. He's, he's yeah. certainly not like a, 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 he's a socialist. He's not a socialist. I mean, I'm, I don't like Biden, but he's not a socialist. Guy, no. You know what I'm saying? But the problem is, is that, it, it, you know, it's, it's, it's starting to feel la- that the issue is deeper. The issue is more that no matter who's in office, whether it's Obama, Democrat, Clinton, Bush, doesn't matter who it is, right? The wealth gap continues to widen. Yeah. Dramatically so. And I think the problem, I think what people are, are getting really pissed at is this concentration of wealth in the hands of a few. So while I, I love the capitalist system, I'm a capitalist through and through, I wonder if there's something a bit off right now. It's just, to me, it seems there's a glitch in the matrix right now. And it says that the way the economy is operating right now, you look at the reality of businesses. You brought up a very interesting point. You said, Listen, a lot of businesses are not doing well right now, but there are some that are doing really well. But if you look at the stock market, it was like reaching all-time highs because of a few massive tech yeah. companies that yeah. have created an artificially exaggerated um, market rally when every day on Main Street people are suffering, right? So it seems to me, and you know, I don't begrudge Jeff Bezos, but it would seem to me that something is fundamentally wrong with a company that's allowed to run amok the way Amazon has, where it's putting average business owners either out of business or making them beholden to Amazon. Like, it's almost like part of me, as much as I hate to say this out loud, I feel that, and I'm probably gonna get shut down, don't shut me down, Facebook, or no, I, I feel that some of these big tech platforms, and Amazon's almost a platform in, its, in the sense that, oh, yeah. you, you know, I feel like they're almost the same thing as utilities. Yep. They're, the, they're the highways and byways of the 1900s and the 2000s where cars driving down the road and um, the mail system, no one owned the mail theoretically, no one owns the highway, you see little patches can be, have tolls and stuff. But it seems to me that companies like Facebook, Twitter, Google, Amazon are utilities. They're not actual businesses anymore, and they should be controlled or certainly broken up into very small pieces and forced to compete. And the way the bells did, the baby bells did, they came with those baby bells. And look what ended up happening. In the 18th, yeah. the 18th, they still rose to the top, right? But I, I think there's something fundamentally wrong with it. I think there's a lack of competition right now, and I think that, it, um, and it's not leading to a lack of innovation because what's happening is the interesting thing about this particular blend of entrepreneurs, they, they're all about innovation. They're always trying to reinvent themselves. Because if they don't, they'll be made obsolete. But the point is, they've created, I think, un, unlevel playing fields at this point. Yeah. Um, what do you think about that? I mean, I think, I think in the same way that it's easy, like you asked me, should we build a startup today, right? I think it's so easy to build a startup today. But imagine being inside Amazon and having unlimited resources, you know, the best engineers in the world, unlimited capital. You know, I think what they've done as a really good job is they know how to build startups as well, right? So they 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 are competing and they're looking at business, they're looking at existing businesses that are working, sure, and they're they're going after what's already proven because right? they're also what's happening. They've gotten such share of the market at this point now. People have to sell this stuff. They see what's working on their own platform. They just copy it and destroy them. Yeah, you know what it actually is that's fair. Yeah, you know what it, you know what it actually is is it's all about the bundle. Now this is what this is what a lot of businesses uh, are afraid of, right? Like. Amazon, you're, there are a lot, most people are paying for Amazon Prime, right? They're paying 70 bucks a year, 80, whatever it is now, like $100 a year, right? It's so much easier for a company to add on something to a bundle that you're already paying for, maybe an incremental charge, similar to cable, right? Cable companies used to offer you uh, internet. And then they said, here, here's a phone service, right? And, and a lot of people signed up for internet through the same provider as your cable. A lot of people signed up for phone service, same provider as your cable, right? A lot of, so think of it, um, Amazon is in the same boat. You're paying them money. It's much easier for you to add on a music subscription to Amazon mm-hmm. than to add, create a new account and a new service and a credit card number on like an Apple Music or no a Spotify, doubt. right? And so I even like, yes, there are, there are threat in startups, but I also think when you're Apple Music or Spotify, you're fearing Amazon as well because they can easily bundle you out essentially, right? They can just, they can just say, uh, for the next two years, we're including unlimited music with Amazon Prime. 
You right. cancel Spotify, you cancel yeah. like you're, you're fucked. It so my could point, knock out so my, my point is, in, in 2000, um, Microsoft was forced to unbundle Explorer. Yep. And, and the whole thing with Netscape, remember that? And the, yeah, and yeah. the antitrust laws. And Microsoft was forced into two because they had too much of a hole in the market. Ironically, look what happened. Like Apple came flying back. But the point is, do you think something should be done with the tech companies right now? Do you think that needs to be antitrust? I, I do. I think that I, there, too, I don't know exactly what, you know, I'm not an expert of this category by any means, but I, I think there are definitely major, major competitive disadvantages to, to startups by these, by these giant companies. And, and, and it, it's, it almost becomes, it, it's, it's kind of like a, a little, a little bit of like a, like a catch. America allows you to build a business really easily. Right. And, and the tool sets we have today in order to build a startup are the best they can be. But on from, the other from, hand, from the actual tools to low capital, yeah. low rates on capital. Yeah. Yeah. But, but on the other hand, as I mentioned, but companies like Amazon, by giving them free reign to do anything they want with, without enough antitrust, you know, um, governance on it, it, it's very challenging to, to build to a certain level, you know, and, and even with, with Pluto, we, we could have kept growing, you know, as an independent company, but you, you start at a certain point to, there are a lot of people like, you know, nipping at our, at our heels and, 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 and that, that drove some of our decision-making across the whole board. You don't want to be like, my space. Yeah. You, like you have something that works, but what if, and we have a lead, can we maintain? Can we maintain it independently? What do you think? Went or wrong? do we need a partner? What do you think went wrong with MySpace? What do you think? What went wrong with MySpace? What's the real reason you think that MySpace just completely imploded? I remember it was the rage, it was everything. I, I think their product didn't change. If, if you if you look at their product, it's it was it's pretty much this when, when it died to when it was born, and it almost looked identical and stayed the same. Um, and and I think Facebook came in and out innovated them and and they did a better job executing as a company like in that in that whole process that i mentioned where you're like a lean startup you're building you're testing and you're putting it out there i just think they got out innovated and they got out executed to be honest i remember thinking that at the time that when i was on myspace i didn't know who i was speaking to that it was all a sham and, and and people were like making their pages there was no there was no real person behind each page yeah. while Facebook started from a positioning of you have to have a legitimate college email yeah. account. You were it was a real person, real page, right? And then they ultimately spread it out. But it was sort of like one was for real and one was not for yeah. real. I, I think the, the core of Facebook is their news feed, right? So uh, we, we naturally have FOMO, this fear of missing out. We mm. check news at multiple times a day. You go on CNN, on Fox, whatever, right? And you see what's the latest. Because we don't want to be we don't want, we have fear of missing out. We don't want to be last to know. We want to know what the latest show is so we could talk about it with our friends. Facebook had the news feed, which was also news, but it's news of your friends. What are your friends up to? What's their status update, right? What, are, where are they going? Where, where are they traveling to you? It's, and, and I think that's where they became a utility, right? And when you're a utility, you're, you're using that service on multiple times a day, right? I think MySpace, as you mentioned, was more, um, like, I guess, public right, rather than private in, in, in your friend group. It wasn't about news updates of your friends. There was a bunch of random people and you didn't really give a shit about what their update was, what they you know what I mean? It was more about people promoting themselves and, and like, oh, I got to get more friends. And, but, but there was no real addiction. There was no FOMO. If I didn't use MySpace for two weeks, nothing really happened. Like I don't miss anything. But if I didn't check Facebook for two weeks, I, I, don't, I could miss out on, you know, what my uncle did or my, my best friend did. You think the world's a better place or a worse place because of social media? Worse. I think, I think a lot of what you're seeing right now um, is because of social media. I think social media has overtaken as a, as a news source for a lot of people than actual news. I think a lot of people get their news from social media, right? And, and, and when they get their news from social media, there and it's not professionally edited and by authentic journalists there are a lot of things that get misconstrued and 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 but they spread so quickly so before things are are uh, you know are are kind of uh, put people put a flag on the on the content which i believe i believe is actually really good that like companies like facebook and and twitter are flagging content to be you know false right but but i think they're doing that for a reason because today that's our source of news 
for a lot of people. And I think, I think it's a problem. We live, that's our first information source be, before anything else. And that's scary. So there's two sides to that coin, right? One is that they censor and they flag, but are they flagging fairly? Yeah. And that's a really big issue, especially among conservatives. Yeah. Conservatives would say that it's absolutely positively um, biased against conservative voices and liberals could say anything they want. Yeah. I believe that's true. Um, Which part? That, that that it's biased against conservatives. Yeah. It is. It's very it's liberal, I, I, liberal leaning, especially. Um, I mean, they all are somewhat. I, I don't think even Twitter tries to hide it. I I, I think that um, it's probably not quite as bad as the conservatives make out. But I think it's very. I think that even one percent of bias is is there's no room for it because it's that big and that important. In other words, the you know one of the old. I didn't make this saying up, but one of the theories about democracy is that is a prerequisite to having a properly functioning democracy is to have news that people can trust, an informed populace. It requires yeah. to have an informed populace. I agree. If the populace is not informed or misinformed, yep. you have democracy stops functioning correctly. I think that's part of why we're having so many problems right now. So it's part of this, part of it, I think, is this bias, but that's, I think, a smaller part. I think far bigger problem is the algorithms that they use to show you more and more of what they think you'll like. So what ends up happening is yep. people are getting in echo chambers. Yep. So they start showing you more and more, and I'm guilty because I, I, you know, I will click on if I if someone has a viewpoint that I don't like, I'm like put them. I'm yeah, done. With, I'm yeah. done with it. If they say it once, I want to see it too much. I don't want to hear it. So over time, they have people. You have two people with diametrically opposed news feeds. One is seeing things that confirm their yeah. core beliefs and on the right. One confirms their core beliefs on the left. And like any system, I always believe things tend to get exaggerated over time. They become mockeries of themselves over time. Like anything typically revolves to the most extreme part of a view over time. So the algorithms like are reinforcing themselves. What do you, yeah. what do you think about I, that? I think it's, you're 100% right. I think it's a very scary combination, right? I mean, all these platforms from Facebook to Twitter, they're in the business of making money from ads, right? The way they make money from ads is they get users like you or like me or anyone else to come to their service or to their app as often as possible. The way you get people to come to your service as often as possible is you show them content that they think you like. Well, that pisses them off. But, but, but well, that, that, makes, but, them hate, but, but that makes you use it more and more. Right. So you're absolutely right that they're in the business of creating custom algorithms for each person in order to determine, in order to get you to come use it more. Right. And, and, and then combine that with the fact that social media is our first news source. Even the president, like the, the way we get news is from his tweets, right? And then it becomes news, right? So it's, it's like tweet first, then it's news everywhere, right? So it's, it's, it's just, this is the way we get our news. And I don't actually think the world, like, you know, right now people are saying like, this is on fire. That's, I don't, I don't think things are actually more on fire than they are. I would agree like, with that. They, they, I don't think people just, are even nearly as divided as they make I, it out. But I, I, I think as much bad stuff is happening today as it did 10 years ago and 20 years ago and 30 years ago, you know, but, I, but right now we're just the floodgate of information. The fire hose of information is so massive and so quick and it spreads instantly right because we're all on social media everyone's sharing everything that we just it just creates this almost like unnecessary uh c conflicts and debates and topics and everyone get heated up and it just spirals out of control and 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 then combine that with the algorithm issue where where these sites want you to use it more i think we're in a real a real problem here what do you think should be done anything should something be done does someone have to intervene is it possible to intervene yeah i think I think there are definitely issues with the censorship side, right? I think it, it, it might be biased. Uh, I'm not 100% sure, but I think it's, it's not fair to critique it because it's so early, mm. right? I think it's, it just started to happen recently. So I think over time, the censorship should continue, but it, it should also, you know, it should improve. And, and hopefully it will, I, I don't know if people will ever believe that it's, it's finally leveled, you know, but I think that, that a lot of the bias will, will, should, sort of taper down. Um, but aside from that, I, you know, I, I don't know. It's just, be, it, it's, 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 it's stuck in this vortex. I don't think it's going away soon. I don't know how to get it out. Did you see the uh, Netflix documentary on the social dilemma? I started to watch it and finish it. Me too. Yeah. So it's interesting. Everybody <laughs> that saw it said, I started watching it and didn't finish it. Yeah. Right? It's a very common yeah. response. It, was, it got a little repetitive. Yeah. Just, so I got think the they point. made their point. They yeah, made, their they made point. the point in the first yeah, 15 minutes. We all knew that. You know, it's ugly to see it. And um, Do you think that whole premise that 
um, tech is intentionally doing things that are manipulative beyond the normal Madison Avenue manipulation. Like Madison Avenue has been doing that forever. Like all ads are based on that, you know, and things that we, um, if you watch Mad Men, watch the TV show Mad Men, like, you know, course, it's, yeah. it's always about like, you oh, know, yeah. ads are designed to that. Spokespeople are, are sending messages, you know, linking, um, you know, Coca-Cola commercials, linking, you know, the world of Coke and the real thing, all these things, right? Yeah. But do you think that um, tech, has taken it to a level that's now become dangerous or is it just the reality? You think it's dangerous? I, th I think it's just the reality. I don't actually think somebody is sitting there like tweaking knobs to go into this direction. I think the algorithms are just so good, right? Uh, that on their own, they're just- Oh yeah, that was they're, metaphorical, of yeah, course, yeah, right? Yeah, yeah. yeah. they were trying to say the, mech, the, the person that wrote the algorithm is Machiavellian. I don't know. I, I think that's bullshit. I think the person who wrote the algorithm was in the, it, their, instruction was, their instruction was get people to use this app as often as possible. Right. It's not like yeah. in the future we want to manipulate people. So let, you know, no, I think that's complete bullshit. Yeah. But, but it's happening because everyone is on social media. You know, like everyone is on everyone. Like even it doesn't matter how old you are. You've got multiple sources of social media. That's where you get your news. And even if you don't use social media, our news is almost like, as I mentioned, like the news reports usually come from like, you know, it used to be just like celebrity gossip comes from some, some shit, like some kind of Instagram post. Now it's literally like, like the president's announcements come from a tweet. You know, it's, it's, it's just, we live in a very different time. What do you think about? influencers do you think the, the the age of the influencer is here to stay or it's a passing yeah so here, trend? Here, here's what i here's what i think about influencers so usually when instagram first came out they didn't have an ad platform they didn't have a way as a business to advertise on instagram but they had masses amount of users but they didn't want to turn on ads right away so people started going to people with big followings as almost an ad platform they were circumventing the fact that Instagram didn't have an app platform. So if I wanted to reach millions of people, I would go to somebody with millions of followers. When, Inst when Instagram turned on their own ad platform, people started to realize that going through an influencer is way more expensive and the conversion rates are way worse than just buying an ad on Instagram, right? So I think what you see, like Vine, let's use that as an example. Vine built a slew of influencers. Why? Vine never had an ad platform. There was no way to advertise on Vine, but they had a shitload of users. So people went to influencers, right? Then those influencers moved to Instagram because Vine died. Same thing happened, no ad platform. People started getting a lot of money for different doing campaigns. Not because it's the right thing to do for a brand, right? But it's because they didn't have any other choice. So there, in brands, there, there's endorsement deals, right? Like, like there's a LeBron right. James, Nike. That's, that to me is when you wanna use an influencer for your brand, you need to do a bigger deal, almost like an endorsement deal where that person becomes like a spokesperson and it's right. continuous and they sign them for a term of six months, a year, two years, whatever, right? That makes sense. But going to influencers to run, uh, to, for them to push your app or your downloads, you're gonna get way better results. There's no question, I, we've done it. We've, done, we, we, we've spent so much money at, at Pluto and even before my previous companies running ads every sort of way, right? Like, so I'm a marketer, so I, I try to find the best ways to market any kind of product, right? So if I'm pushing app downloads, I wanna find users who get the best kind of users to download my app for the lowest amount possible. So we've tried influencers, we've tried ads. Ads always win, hands down. Interesting. So what do you make of, the other side of the equation is, is these insta-famous people, the kids. I, I look at this and somewhat bothered by some of it. I'm, I'm bothered by people who become famous for no reason other than that they're famous. There's something about it that I think that rubs not just me, most right. people the wrong way. At least make a sex tape. Yeah, at least make a sex tape like Paris Hilton, <laughs> right? But Paris Hilton, listen, Paris Hilton also had, you know, say what you want about her, but she was, she was you know, she was from a very famous family. She had pedigree. Yep. I could understand why people would, would be interested in Paris Hilton. I find it very difficult. I'm trying to still wrap my arms around it why some of the people who have these huge social followings have them. Like, I don't think they, 
Like, and I guess and it's not, it's not jealousy. It's really not. It's just, it's, it's a lack of understanding. It's wanting to know why. No. Cause I think there's value in trying to understand what is driving people to follow people who have nothing to offer them. Well, I don't think it's nothing to offer. I think they're, what are they, they, what are they, they have offering? some kind of talent. What? They're, they're, it could be a combination of looks and, and talent, right? They could be funny. They could be good looking. They could be, you know, doing pranks. Like, you, you know, know what Amanda I mean? Cerny? What's that? Amanda Cerny. Sure. She has, Talent, like I can see, Amanda's beautiful. She's very funny, self-deprecating. You look at her stuff; it's hysterical. Yeah. I get that. So, man, so like Amanda would make sense to me. See, I get that. You know, she's beautiful to look at, hysterical, and a sweet person, right? But a lot of these people, I'm like, I don't get it. Like, well, I don't but, see, I don't see any. But not, I, but not everyone's your type, right? I, so for, I for others, there, there. But are, I, I do they, believe. Maybe I'm. I do believe there's people out there with no talent. That's, I don't understand what it is. Is this something? Or maybe am I wrong? I think you're wrong. Yeah, I'm wrong. I think they have some kind of talent for some kind of audience that maybe you don't see it, but others do. And it doesn't mean I see it, but I think it's definitely working. They're definitely following them because. For example, Jake Paul right. and Logan Paul, right? I know Jake, Logan's been on my podcast. I know Jake, right? They had this thing called Team 10, yeah. where they were just making people famous because if you're on my thing, people will view you too. Yeah. And people riding coattails like that. That really probably had no business. But I don't think they randomly went to a mall and picked 10 people out. You know what I mean? I think they, they had a criteria of like, okay, I got to get somebody based on maybe an existing following, maybe some kind of looks, no, maybe, no, sometimes maybe acting just, ability, maybe they're funny. People, maybe would, they could, people would just approach them and buy their way in. Yeah. I right. mean, it's possible. I, I, I don't think, I, uh, let me rephrase it in a way. I sure. think it's much easier for somebody, like let's say you're going for a movie the scrutiny of figuring out the right actor or actress for a movie is way, way bigger, way harder than, than what's the criteria for becoming famous on TikTok, right? Mm. So I think, it, I think you're right in the sense that the, there's, there are opportunities for more people to join that train. But I do think they still have to have some kind of boxes to check, right? Whether it's looks, whether it's the comedy, like there, there has to be something, but it's almost like, look at, look at it as almost like mini actors, or actresses, they they still have to have some kind of. Skill. I think the distinction. Let me tell you what You're I. You're not going to agree with me. No, no, I, no, I think <laughs> no, I think actually we can come to agree because I think that some of the things you said now have clarified my thoughts a bit, and I think the distinction is there's the old adage about 15 minutes of fame, 15 seconds, yeah. right? And I think what happens nowadays is that it's very easy to get massive followers when something happens but the talented ones are able to maintain them yeah. and maintain engagement so i think it's about engagement and not followers I think there's a lot of people 100%. out there with a, with a lot of followers but very low engagement and yeah. they're not and those people so they appear to be a lot more insta famous than they really are because 100 percent. i think that's what i think the misleading part is that people that you think are actually oh they have five million followers no they just had this engagements through this shit follower like, you know what I'm saying? That, you know that's many, the distinction. You know how many people do campaigns to gain followers? Of course. Of course. To gain, like, but stupid shit. Like, like no, you've, the, the you've seen it. Yeah, you've seen it. Like, giveaways. Like, yeah, follow all. these 72 yes. people and get yes. a chance to win $20,000. Exactly. But, yeah. but, but they're not intentionally following them in a genuine way right. because they like them. They're following them because they want a chance exactly. to win $20,000. Exactly. With 8 million followers, that gets 20,000 views on, yeah, on their post. Yeah, but that's right? bullshit. So, right. like, engagement is all that matters. And, and, but, yeah, some of them actually became famous because they, they probably had one or two viral hits. Right. Right? But there's a reason they, it went viral, right? That's it, fine. It but could be accidental. Point, but it's not, but, 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 but the point is maintain, is yeah. made. that's, that's right. why I say like, when, when, if anyone that says anything bad about Kim Kardashian, you're an idiot. Yeah. They have, there's massive talent yeah. and purpose there for, for me. Decades. To decades, to maintain yeah. that, to me yeah. is like a very, 100%. that's talent, that's, that's, that's real skill, talent. that's entrepreneurship versus a one hit wonder and they're gone. So yep. I think, I think there's a lot of, I think misinformation about there where people apparently are famous. They're really not. They just yeah. had a couple of hits in there yeah. and follows no, no engagement. Don't look at followers yeah. as, a, that's the, as an indicator of fame yeah. Yeah. or talent. Okay. So I think we, that's why I thought we okay. could agree. That's yeah. really what it comes yeah. to having numbers, right? <laughs> what do you think the future is for, um, not for, not, not just for you, but for like, for where does this go? This world tech world go? Where, where are we going right now? What's the next stop? In, in what perspective? In the sense that, like, I think, like, you know, Internet 1.0 was like eyeballs. Let's yeah. get people to come look at your website. That, you know, then it became, okay, wait, they got to buy some shit. We got to make money. Then came, like, the stuff where I'm going to take old world things like uh, taxis and make them Ubers. Yeah. I'm going to take dog walking services and make all the services that became 
uh, Nate sort of you know Uberized all yeah, these yeah, yeah. services. What's the next level? This is the biggest. The last few years have been about that, like those Uber of, of all these different things, and sort of using the internet to power what was once an o- offline service. What do you yeah. think the next level is? I think we're going to continue. Uh, unfor- and it's unfortunately going to kill a lot of jobs, but we're going to continue replacing human jobs with automation. I think we're going to very quickly find ourselves in a world where you drive through a McDonald's drive through and there are literally zero humans inside, right? I think it's already happening where Amazon has stores where you put a bunch of things in your shopping cart. Uh, every single item has like an NFC chip and you literally run your cart through the exit and your account is already tied to it and, and everything's paid for and there's no one in the store, right? So I think... And it's already happening in factories, right? There are less and less people. And similar to, you know, farming used to be all like, it used to be the, I think the biggest driver of jobs in this, in this whole country. Now it's tiny, single digits, right? So I think the same thing is going to happen across, across the board from truck drivers to cashiers to retail jobs to Starbucks to McDonald's. I think technology is going to continue to automate. I think in addition to that, there are going to be way more things focused on this convenience aspect, similar to delivery and like the Postmates, the Ubers. I think we're going to find a lot more people at their home. I think people are going to be driving less and owning less cars and are going to be more in autonomous vehicles and or taking Ubers and not even owning things, right? And I think a lot of times people, it's going to be a combination of people saying, I don't even need to drive anywhere because everything comes to me, right? And then and then the, the idea of like cost of like owning a car won't even be necessary at that point. You know, I think that's another. And I think the final one, this is, in my opinion, five man with an Aston Martin and a, and a, and a, and a, and a Tesla. It's hard to get an Uber right now. <laughs> like it really is. Like you call an Uber, you will literally wait for, really? have, you, have you tried? No. It's, it's like during, I don't know if it's a combination of a lot, a lot of drivers are scared to be drivers right now or, or what, but like it's hard to get a fucking Uber. But, uh, but uh, sorry, the yeah. last thing, I, I think one big thing in technology that's going to change everything is, is uh, 5G and 6G, whatever it goes. So not from a conspiracy theory perspective, but from um, right now, our phones have storage, right? They're, they're, they have memory because you need to download information. They need to process it. So whenever we, we need an app, we download an app, right? When internet is fast enough, I don't think people realize this, our phones will just be screens because you won't even need to download an app you just go to the app store and open an app, right? Because it's just so fast, the app just opens, right? When the app just opens and things don't need to be stored anymore, you take a photo, it's instantly in the cloud. Right now, it goes to your phone first and it uploads in the cloud because the internet's slow. But imagine like super fast internet everywhere with no dead spots, right? This, as fast as it is in your house, it's everywhere if not faster. When that exists, it actually is going to disrupt a lot more things in technology than people realize. I think phones That's become in- screens. Really interesting right? point. We're not going to have routers in the home. We're not even going to. There's no need for like a Wi-Fi hotspot in your house. When when literally T-Mobile or whoever, the hotspot's the whole fucking country, and it's so fast. We're literally the, the data is just being processed instantly. So, so I think that's going to create a lot more opportunities in uh, when, when when people start thinking things are real time, right? And things don't need to be stored. And we're first of all, like our batteries are going to get better because they're, they don't, they're all their powering is a screen. You know, I think that's going to, that's a whole new wave of things that are coming. Hmm. Worst last question, right? It's a, a it's two parts. Part one, worst business in the world to go into right now. Oof. I don't know. What do you think? Restaurant. Owner. Yeah. <laughs> because of COVID or are you think in general? COVID. In general, COVID. I think I think that there's been a, I think there's a paradigm shift. I, yeah, I I think that's one of those things that will absolutely bounce back. I think once COVID goes away, uh, people are itching to get the hell out, and and I think it's going to be uh, like a surge until the next. It's similar to until, airlines until right now. They're, they're, well, so okay, so when European, what's the worst business to be in? Anything. I, I think retail is tough. You know, I think I think retail businesses, retail storefront, retail. storefront. You know, there's so many clothes. Brick and mortar retail. Brick and mortar. It's just it's tough. There's it, it's it, there's it's it, it's it's to me it's weird. Like, even in California, we have a lot of like marijuana dispensaries everywhere. It makes no sense. It makes no fucking sense. Why do you need to go to a store to get the same product that's available at like thirty locations within three miles of you if it could just be delivered properly? Sure. I just don't think people have built a proper service for it. Best business to be in. Something that that automates things that used to be done by humans. So human replacement things. Human 
improvement just, slash replacement just things, or replacement. It's just things that automate, like things that where machines and technology takes control uh, on, on, onto things that humans used to do on a manual way. I think that's going to be, that's the next revolution is like automation. It, it really is. Buddy, you're the man. Thanks for coming. Yeah, thanks it's for having me. a great episode here. Everybody, you have a website that you have people follow? You know, no. He's, nice. He's got nothing to sell. I got, yeah. just follow me on Instagram. Follow me on Instagram. Ilya never sleeps. Ilya never sleeps. Ilya is, always has beautiful girls around him because. Oh, come on. It's a good thing. Yeah. Why not? Don't get me in trouble. No, your girlfriend's beautiful. Thank you. A lot of you know, the friends of hers are beautiful. I'm yeah. saying that you're a player. You just, uh, you, uh, <laughs> no, you're just a, a solid dude, man. Appreciate anyway, it. everybody. Share this episode with your friends and your family, young, old, and everyone in between. People need to know this information. And I'll see you on the next episode of The Wolf's Den. Thanks, buddy. All right, here's the deal. So America gets back to work. You want and need every possible advantage out there to succeed in the new economy. Smart companies run on NetSuite by Oracle, the world's number one cloud-based business system. So receive your free guide right now at netsuite.com slash wolf. That is netsuite.com slash wolf. All right, this next section here is about business and making lots of money. Here's the deal. I'm having a small group of people over to my home in Los Angeles, and the question all of them are asking is, what's next in life? You know, these are people who had massive success already and they're looking to see what's that one thing, that one distinction that will take them to the next level of money and success. So you'll be getting close right now to that seven figures a year. Maybe you're trying to get to eight figures a year. The point is that this is an opportunity for you right now to come to my house in Beverly Hills, Los Angeles here, right? And join with nine other people all of them ultra high achievers to attend my mastermind event, which is led by me. Now it's gonna happen here is very special and it's gonna be nothing short of life changing. You and this group of top business leaders are gonna spend the weekend with me in intense regimented brainstorming sessions where you're also gonna get to have some time about an hour or more with one-on-one -on -one consulting with me personally along with a special breakout session where I'm gonna be sharing the most cunning edge secrets of sales, marketing strategy, things I'm using myself right now to scale my own businesses in a massive way. But the real magic, by the way, of this mastermind is you're also gonna get it sit in the hot seat in front of all these other top performers. In other words, every person in the mastermind is gonna have that opportunity for an hour or more to sit in the hot seat where all the collective energy, brain power, and experience will be laser guided on you, focused on you and your company, and helping you take things to the next level. Things that you thought were impossible before this day will start to become very possible for you as soon as you leave. When this is over, you're gonna go home feeling energized with new ideas, new plans, and most importantly, a network of very powerful new contacts who are gonna help you make them happen fast. In other words, I'm opening up my entire Rolodex to you as all the people who are attending to do the same. I'm telling you the results that you're gonna get here from this mastermind will be nothing short of staggering. Now, a little bit about how this actually works. First, you're gonna fly into Los Angeles and my driver, Abdul, will pick you up at the airport. We'll have your favorite drinks waiting for you at my house. We'll also have a world-class chef there to cater some of the best meals you've ever had. This is gonna be fun, and it's gonna be about learning and business and camaraderie, all the best things in life wrapped up into one. I guarantee you will walk out of this mastermind event with a new, improved, much bolder, and more powerful vision for your future, a new plan, and massively powerful new context to take your life and your business to the next level. So what you need to do right now is go to jordanbelfort.com slash mastermind and apply. That's jordanbelfort.com slash mastermind and apply right now. Do not miss this opportunity. It's once in a lifetime and it's life changing. All right, real quick, listen, if you're a CEO, you're a sales manager, or you're involved in hiring for your company, I want you to check out my new organization, Straight Line Hiring. What we do is we deliver expertly trained salespeople to companies like yours. 
world-class salespeople trained by me and delivered to you on demand. Go to my website, jordanbelfort.com. Check out Straight Line Hiring, the only way to grow your company with certainty.